Welcome to Applied Photophysics, third installment of our webinar series, Beyond Alpha Helix and Beta Sheet, The Expanding Role of Circular Dichroism. I'm your host, Keith Solomon, and today's webinar is being given by Dr. Russ Mada from the University of Kansas. After a few brief introductory remarks, I'll introduce our esteemed guests and begin the main portion of our program. Before we get started, I'd like to remind all of our viewers that our program today will last for approximately 45 minutes, with five minutes of introductory remarks, a 30-minute presentation by Dr. Mada, which would be followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. If at any point during the presentation you have a query, please submit your question in the provided window. We will be reviewing the questions as they are submitted and we'll choose the best, most germane questions to pose to Dr. Mada at the end of his presentation. Also, there will be a very short survey after the webinar is finished, which will pop up automatically for all attendees. So please take a few minutes to complete the survey in order to help us improve this webinar series. First, I'll begin by introducing the sponsor of today's webinar, Applied Photophysics. Applied Photophysics manufactures CD spectrometers that allow for the precise, well-resolved, and reproducible analyses of complex biomolecules. Consequently, the spectra produced by the Chiroscan technology platform is quite amenable to mathematical modeling and statistical testing which in turn allows for objective go and no-go decisions and supports the publication of data with true confidence. For more information concerning the Chiroscan technology platform and the applied photophysics line of stop flow instruments, please visit us at www.photophysics.com. Now on to the main event. Dr. Russell Mada earned a BS from the University of California, Santa Cruz, a PhD from Cornell University, and he completed his postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Minnesota. He is currently a distinguished professor of pharmaceutical chemistry at the University of Kansas School of Pharmacy. Dr. Mada has authored over 400 published reports and several patents. His research interests include understanding the causes and mechanisms of protein instability. It is important for our listeners to know that Dr. Mada is using our instrumentation for applications that we currently do not support. And if you would like further information about using our instrumentation in the manner he will be describing, please refer to his published studies or contact him directly. But that being said, while we do not currently support some of these applications, we may well in the future. And we want to encourage our viewers to let us know about the novel ways you are using our instrumentation as we really do want to support innovation and learn from and share with the wonderful scientists that are working with the Chiroscan platform. So please let us know about the interesting science that you're creating with our technology. So with all that out of the way, and without further ado, Dr. Ross Madow will present multi-dimensional confirmation analysis using circular dichroism. Dr. Madow. Hello, everyone. I'm rearranging things on the table here. Okay. What I'm going to talk about today is, is really data analysis, primarily using data obtained from circular dichroism, but also from other kinds of data that can be extracted from the instrument, as well as adding other methods. And that will become clear as I, as I proceed. So in my first slide, I show an elephant. And you might ask, what does an elephant have to do with things? Many of you may have seen this slide before, because it attempts to make the point 
that if you can look at something in many different ways, you have a chance of building up a better picture of it. Now, shown below, if you look at just a small region, you can come to fairly erroneous conclusions. And, uh, and we're not going to be talking about uh, elephants today. We're primarily going to be talking about big molecules, proteins. And at the end, I'm going, actually going to talk about a biopolymer as well that's used as a drug. Um, I take a particular orientation here from the fact that I am interested in pharmaceutical uses of biomolecules. So I have a list here of the papers from which I obtained these slides. And um, the references are fairly complete. I think you should be able to find them all. And I, I haven't uh, correlated the actual list of references here with the, um, with the individual slides. But it's easy enough probably from the title to do that. And if you have a problem, you wonder where a slide came from, just drop me an email at uh, midaw at ku.edu. That's M-I-D-D-A-U-G-H at ku.edu. I also want to use this as an acknowledgement slide. And as you can see, of course, I haven't included all the authors, but I'd like to especially acknowledge um, in the second paper, John Ralston, who's a physicist at the University of Kansas, who helped especially in the early phases uh, of the work that I'm going to describe to you. And finally, I'd also like to acknowledge especially uh, Jay Kim, the first author on the third paper, who wrote the software that was used, the final version of the software, to do all of this work. The actual experiments were done by a wide variety of people. And if you're interested, find the paper and you can see who did the work. And with a little luck, you might be able to figure out where they are if you want to talk with them. If not, contact me and I'll, I'll tell you where they currently are. Almost all, of course, are located elsewhere now. So the next slide shows a list of techniques that are routinely used for characterization of macromolecules. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with almost all of these techniques. I'm not going to talk about all of them today, but I'm going to focus on the first uh, seven or so. Near and far UV absorbance, near and far UV circular dichroism, intrinsic and extrinsic fluorescence, and although I won't talk about it today, red edge excitation refers to a fluorescence experiment and can be used to get dynamic information. There are references given which can be found in the appropriate paper. Now, the next slide shows our laboratory in the Macromolecule and Vaccine Stabilization Center at the University of Kansas. And what you, three, what you see are three Chiroscan spectropolarimeters, one having an auto sampler. And these instruments run virtually continuously in our laboratory. And it's really their increased uh, sensitivity and precision that it's allowed us to do some of the work that I'm going to describe to you today. Right, the first data slide, and you can ignore the figure numbers because these are the actual numbers we took from the original papers. But this shows some spectra in the near UV region some circular dichroism spectra. And it shows the spectra as a function of uh, concentration in the upper upper and the, the constant in the effect of uh, path length on the lower. And you see a bit expanded version of them uh, on the right panels to clarify the peaks that we're going to use to uh, monitor the effects of various kinds of stress on the molecule. Now, I chose here to use some reference proteins rather than the proteins that we normally study. We don't study BSA, obviously. Um, but I, later on, I will look at some other proteins as, as well. But this is data which, if you want to do a comparison or have an idea, you, of course, could run reference spectra using serum albumins. All right, so what you see in, in figure A is this region of the spectra that's dominated by peaks from tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine, and, and disulfide bonds as well. And you can see these peaks have quite a bit of structure. The data, which is using a two centimeter path length cells, you, you can see that as you drop the concentration, of course, uh, the spectra get more difficult to resolve, but are still resolvable. And if you go to the next slide, 
you can see the full ultraviolet spectrum. And the region that I just showed you is, is circled. And you could see that under normal circumstances, you can't really see much in the near, in the near UV region. But if, if you blow up those regions of the spectra, you can actually see very well-resolved, highly reproducible peaks. And we can use these peaks to monitor changes in tertiary structure as we vary things like temperature, pH, et cetera. And I think and for many years, we didn't realize, and I think it's because the instruments just weren't as sensitive as they are today, that that region um, from above 200, 260 nanometers was actually resolvable even during runs in the far ultraviolet region. It was thought that you had to change the, change the parameters. You had to go to a higher path length. You had to go to a higher concentration. But it turns out that in many cases, you don't have to do that. So the next slide, we just show some melting curves in this region. We show the melting of the secondary structure using uh, the peak at 222 nanometers. And you can see how, how nice the data is. Of course, things get noisier as you go into the infrared region, but you can still in, into the, uh, the near ultraviolet, and you can see that uh, you still, however, get quite well-resolved uh, spectra and average values for these individual peaks, but there's an increase in noise. But it doesn't stop you, for example, for determining things like TM, and if you compare the TMs at the three different wavelengths, uh, they're all about 64 degrees. Now, if we look at the thermal stability, and uh, we can do this in a number of different ways, we can, of course, dramatically increase the amount of information that we can obtain. And this, these are um, ultraviolet spectra, and one is an optical density plot in a non-absorbing region to look at the aggregation that takes place at more elevated temperatures. You can see the strong pH dependence here. And uh, you can see that it's all very, very well resolved. And if you go to the next slide, we present another way of looking at this kind of data. So these are called empirical phase diagrams. And they're obtained from the data from a Chiroscan Plus. And the data sets, in some cases, are obtained from other instruments as well. And once again, Okay, this is bovine serum albumin, a reference protein. And if you look carefully, you can see that these diagrams are fairly similar, although don't be distracted by the differences in color. The actual color itself doesn't mean anything. So how do we make these? Well, it's, it's very simple, actually. What you do is you take data, and you have data at different temperatures and different pHs. And what you do is you put that data in the form of a matrix. And you construct that matrix, and then you can do various things to the matrix. In this particular case, we've done a form of singular value deconvolution, and then assign colors based on an RGB color scheme. Now, you could choose different colors if you wanted. We just chose RGB because it's very easy for the computers to do this. And I'm going to show you a lot of this type of data. So in the next slide, once again, bovine serum albumin. And it shows better the reproducibility and the high precision of the data you can obtain. So on the left, in A and D, we have uh, circular dichroism data from 222 nanometers. Then we have intrinsic fluorescence. And in fact, this can be obtained from a, um, a, a fluorescence monitor, an emission monitor on a circular dichroism instrument. And we actually have attachments on our Chiro scans that allow us to directly obtain this data. And finally, by looking at the optical density uh, in terms of absorbance units, you can also get information showing you know, increases in size or, if you like, light scattering from uh, the result of increases in temperature. And it note gets, starts getting pretty noisy there, as you might expect, as particles begin to form. Now, below that, is a different way of formulating the data. Notice up higher, we use the actual physical measurements from the instruments. But below, what we've done is we've taken the data and normalized it. And we call these normalized versions structural indices. And 
the secondary structure one goes from 1 to 0, the fluorescence from 1 to 0, and the aggregation index. So it's just a normalization of the data. And we do that for a reason, and that's shown in the next slide. Um, here are two phase diagrams constructed from that, the data that you just saw. Um, the one on the left is uh, the traditional empirical phase diagram made by forming large matrices and then basically looking for what, what are the three largest contributions to the actual value of, in this case it's actually a vector that describes the behavior in terms of the three different types of measurements. But on the right we've used, instead of using the absolute values to this, we've used um, data from the empirical indices. And so this allows you to m raise the level of interpretability because you know which color corresponds to which, um, to which index. And you look to the right, there are three showing the behavior from a particular method. And it's the summation of all these that constructs the empirical phase diagram, the uh, three indices empirical phase diagram. Now there are other ways to do this, and I feel duty bound because not everybody likes empirical phase diagrams. By the way, I probably should comment on the use of that word empirical uh, because uh, they're not thermodynamic phase diagrams, which would imply that there's complete reversibility between the phases. And while there is sometimes is, there frequently is not. In other words, as you go to elevated temperatures, for example, or to extremes of pH, often you can't reverse that because of, say, the formation of aggregates or some other phenomena. Now, here we show two different methods. One we call a radar chart. And some of you may be familiar with the radar chart. I noticed in automobile magazines recently, they're rating cars and putting the various characteristics of the car such as its price, how fast it is, how well it handles, et cetera, et cetera. They put those in the form of these, uh, these radar charts. And so in the radar charts, what you do is you just, define, you just take normalized data and you put a point corresponding to it and then draw a polygon that, co that connects all of those lines. And so that's shown on the left and the region of greatest interest is shown on the, upper, on the upper right is an expansion, so you can see it a little bit better. There's another way to do this, and that's to use something we call Chernoff faces, obviously invented by Chernoff. And uh, in this, what we do is we use facial features to evaluate the phenomena in question. So, and, and the, the kind of, you don't have to do this, by the way, you can do anything you want. It's all arbitrarily assigned by the user. But in this case, we've made, for example, the regions where the proteins are stable. We've given characteristics that uh, look like a friendly face, like a smile, wide open eyes, etc. And as things get rougher for the macromolecule, we can turn uh, the face and have to have a frown and eyes to close and the eyebrows to arch, etc., etc. You don't need to do that. That's just a cute thing, and people who do this like, like to do that. So these are two additional ways to do this. Now, <laughs> let me show you how these things work in some detail. And so what we have are these three different ways of visualizing the data. On the left is the, uh, the empirical phase diagram, then in the middle the radar diagrams, and right the Chernoff faces. And if you look at the um, boundaries between the empirical phases, you see they're all the same. So the choice of how you want to present the data is up to you. But the important thing is to realize that just by looking at one of these, you get a global picture of the behavior of the macromolecule. In this case, as a function of temperature and pH. But of course, you can choose any variable you want. In, in the pharmaceutical world, we're sometimes interested in uh, various kind, different kinds of stresses, like shaking, for example, or freeze-thaw events. And you can replace the axes with that kind of, with that kind of stress measurement as well. In, in the next slide, okay, we have a different protein. It doesn't matter what it is, it's an antigen that we were working on. And once again, you can see that all three methods of presenting the data are the same. And really, 
sometimes you can make your choice on which way to present the data based on actually just subjectively on its appearance. And here's the actual data, okay, that was used to construct that phase diagram. Here's another one for a different protein. And finally, I have a, I constructed about 40 of them to show you. I mean, we recently published review and we have over 200 there. But what you can see is how characteristic a phase diagram is of a, an individual unique protein. Okay, now I want to give a couple examples here. And the first example I've chosen is to look at mutants of fibroblast growth factor 1, which is a um, protein that binds to uh, protein kinase receptors, which activates um, a wide variety of phenomena in cells. So typically, it stimulates growth. And uh, the actual mutants, which are uh, ordered by something we don't need to worry about here, but the actual mutations are given on the left. And the free energy that was calculated from, uh, from protein unfolding experiments. And then there's some biological measurements here. They're really the rate at which the cells grow. Excuse me for a moment. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, what you see is that the activities, both with and without heparin, FGF1 is a heparin binding protein, and that heparin is necessary for its stability, and it actually functions through binding to heparin-like molecules in the cell. You can see there's, in that case, a dramatic, uh, dramatic difference in the activities, and furthermore, uh, the half-lives are different, although we were only able to get data for a few of them. So here's some of the actual data itself. And these are proteins now that differ by only a mutation or two. And you can see the circular dichroism in the upper left, okay. And circular dichroism at different wavelengths. And you can see how we've got a very broad picture. The thing to realize is how much information there is right here. There is a lot of information. There's information because each point that you have is going to reflect whatever it is you're measuring at a particular pH and at a particular temperature. So if you code that in the form of a matrix, you have a huge matrix that carries a tremendous amount of individual information. Next slide. Okay, excuse me. <coughs> um, <coughs> sorry. Next slide is different measurements, okay? These are intrinsic fluorescence measurements, which also can be obtained from a CD. I apologize, excuse me. It's drier here than in Kansas. It's hard it may be to believe, um, being that Kansas is a kind of paradise, but we won't get into that. Anyway, more mutants. Finally, some uh, fluorescence experiments using a dye. These are, of course, these are extrinsic measurements in which you look at the binding of the dye. 8 analino naphthalene sulfonic acid. <coughs> Light scattering. Once again, quite obtainable from a circular dichroism instrument, but you could also get it from any number of different ways, a simple spectrometer, an actual light scattering system, whatever. And finally, here's a comparison right here of these different mutants. And you can see how the different mutants are well defined by these phase diagrams and immediately show the difference in characteristics. In this case, is a function of temperature and pH, the two most common variables that we use. So if we go to the next slide, okay, here are four different mutants with and without heparin to show the dramatic effect that heparin has. Um, these, these use intrinsic fluorescence, right, and circular dichroism at 228 nanometers. And you can see the dramatic shift in the phase boundaries as the heparin binds. So the last... The last example I'd like to define is not a protein. <laughs> and what happened here was that um, we got a grant from the Food and Drug Administration to work on methods to compare follow-on biologics to their, um, to, to their original versions. And we were going to work on proteins. We have, by the way, we have a set of data that, and I didn't show any of this here, but you can find it easily enough that uh, looks at um, 
FC regions of immunoglobulins which are differentially glycosylated. And we did the same thing there that I'm going to show you here, but I thought it would be more interesting to make the point that, of course, circular dichro is, is a powerful technique for more than simply, um, than simply proteins. So what we did now, so what is crophelomer first? Well, it's a drug that's derived from a, a tree, a tropical tree. If you take the sap out of this tree, it's bright red. And it turns out that bright, bright red sap is an effective anti-diarrheal agent that's especially used in AIDS patients who are undergoing antiviral therapy. And it's a very important drug, very powerful, but the material is a very difficult material to discuss analytically because it's a mixture of polymers of different lengths. And furthermore, um, it, it has a variable properties. And so what we did was we wanted to see, let's see if we can actually construct maps and use, in this case, we're going to use some machine learning techniques to look at whether or not we can differentiate the different, the different uh, crophelomer molecules from one another. So here's data, and there, what we show here are on the left are UV absorption spectra, and uh, these are the different fractions, and they're shown as a function of storage times. And uh, you can see that you have a wide variety of different responses to different conditions with these different fractions. And here are the circular dichroism spectra from crophelomer. And once again, you can see fairly dramatic differences in the crophelomer molecule as a function of uh, temperature and, and time, time for going as long as uh, a month. So what do you do with data like this if you want to compare two things? Well, a powerful approach is that of employing machine learning. And what we do in machine learning, so-called supervised machine learning, is we use a number of different parameters to try to classify data. And here are a list of these methods, and I'm not going to attempt to go through them all. In fact, until I started to do this work, the only one I knew about was the random forest algorithm. And I, I showed the data to a biomathematician who laughed at me and said, why are you doing uh, random forest, and I had no answer for that other than I knew how to do the random forest algorithm and interpret the data. And he pointed out there were many, many other methods, and I won't go through how they work. Uh, they have different meanings, and they allow you to examine data over a wide range, wide range of values. So here's some of this data, and I know this isn't the easiest thing to look at. And here we constructed something we call a mutual information score that asks, it compares the amount of information and the information that overlaps in different spectra. And so in the upper left, you see data from UV visible, and in the right, from circular dichroism. And then below, to emphasize that you can use a number of texts, we, we have FTIR data. And what we can do with this data is we can take it and we can analyze it using a variety of different methods. And shown here are the mutual information scores and then slices of data for size exclusion chromatography and hydrophobic interaction chromatography. And you know, what you can see here is that there's a tremendous amount of information. And using this kind of technique, we can sort out what information is the same in different techniques and what information differs to help us combine the techniques. And so in the next slide, have the actual data, okay? Now, this is, this is a summary of a tremendous amount of data. And this is, of course, so often difficult to look at. But what we looked at is how much information we can extract from a technique using these different classification seams. And so in some cases, we can get up to 100% and others not, not so great. But what I'd like to emphasize is which techniques work better and also which, tech, which technologies, which classification schemes work better. And if you look and just glance through the data, I think you can see pretty quickly 
that this LDA, which is a linear discriminant analysis, what that stands for, is amazingly effective using many of these methods. And it actually works best when you combine methods. So if you look to the left, and if you look carefully, what you're going to see is there's one method almost always that appears, and that's circular dichroism. It appears to be the most information-rich method when you try to compare samples to one another, which worked, um, in this case, extremely well. It also worked, and I'm not going to show any of the data, extremely well for those different FC regions that differentially were differentially glycosylated. In that case, some of the differences were only a single carbohydrate unit, yet we could clearly discriminate between them. So why was the FDA interested in this? Well, they want to be able to compare these new follow-on biologics to the original versions of the macromolecular drugs. And I think the, the concern was with something so ill-defined as crefelmer. Once again, it's a mixture of these polymers of different sizes. Uh, and we show here that it's quite possible to do that simply by using a combination of different methods. So that's the last of my slides, and I, I just want to make a couple of comments now about this. Um, for those of you who are not oriented toward this kind of thing, you might think, well, this is difficult, but it isn't. That's the point. It's actually pretty simple, um, and I say that as someone who wrote none of the programs. They were written for, for me by students and postdocs in the lab who actually knew how to program. And, uh, and the programs are available. The final version of, the, of, of what was used here were obtainable from um, my student uh, who's now at um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture Laboratories in Arkansas. I don't know why I went there, but that's why he's, that's where he is. And he has control of those programs, and I don't have control of them. I mean, I have a, a complete use of them, of course, but the reason being that he wrote them, and I thought they should belong to him. And you can find his name, J. Kim, J-A-E-K-I-M, and I think he'd probably be willing to supply you with the programs. The, the program package is much larger than what you're seeing here. It contains a lot of other things that we routinely use, which you may or may not be interested in. So with that, and I think I stayed well within my time limits, so almost right on the top. Okay, uh, we'll entertain questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Madal. I believe our viewers, our listeners got a lot of really interesting information from that talk, novel ways of really looking at this biophysical data and understanding uh, how, how to see a protein through using all these different data streams. And I, I really think that was very educational. Um, we do have some time for questions and answers. And um, some of our uh, viewers have written in some really pertinent questions, uh, quite germane to the talk that you were given. One question, and this is a pretty basic question, you mentioned looking at a far and near UVCD in a single experiment. Can you comment about the path length and buffer choices that you would use for that? Sure. Um, these are obtained empirically. And I imagine for most of you, if you've done near UVCD, what you typically did was took uh, a path length of um, usually more than a few millimeters, might even be a centimeter, and then a relatively high concentration of the protein. Of course, you can't go too high, can you? You've got to keep the your voltage is within a reasonable range. And the only way to, to obtain that kind of data is to try it. But once you've obtained it, then you can reproducibly uh, do a single scan to get all of the data together. Now, with that in mind, um, it's, this is not usually done. And I think that, uh, oh, 10 years ago, the spectral polarimeters just didn't have the sensitivity and the precision to obtain the kind of data you need to do this, but they do now. And so there's nothing to stop you from doing it, but I will give one warning, and that is that sometimes you can't do it. You can't find that compromise between path length 
and concentration that gives you good data, in which case you'll have to resort to an, to independent experiments. Always resort to empiricism <laughs> when, when theory is just not enough. Um, and that's, uh, of course, all good scientists do that. So thank you very much for that answer. Uh, we have a couple of other questions here. Um, you did talk about the normalization of the data. Um, can you describe that in a little more detail for our viewers? Well, nothing fancy here at all. You just use the extremes of the data for normalization. If you have, say, a melting curve, you take the lower values and set those to zero. The maximum values seen are set to one. Now, one thing you may want to do, however, is if you have oh, something like aggregation that goes extremely high, then you may find that all the other values are very, very low because you've normalized that extreme data. So you may choose to set some, uh, some limitations on the data so you can bring everything into a convenient scale. I'm sure some of our viewers, listeners, um, are interested in um, biosimilars. And uh, one of our uh, viewers has asked, um, how can CD be used in the right way to characterize a biosimilar? So are there any specific things that you, you would think would be uh, important in a, a detailed CD characterization to compare a biosimilar to an innovator drug? Um, that's a very good question, actually, and it's it's a topic that's still under discussion, especially at the regulatory level, where ultimately they will probably use this data. As you probably know, um, the major problem is right now, this kind of data is not used in final filings and approvals for drugs. It's used more uh, at the early stages to characterize molecules. But I think that's going to change as the answer to your question becomes uh, better, better resolved. So what are some of the things we think you have to be able to do? Well, one, of course, is the quality of the protein itself. And so if your biosimilar is, uh, is, not, going, is not really biosimilar, there's a good chance CD is going to pick that up. And, you know, there's always a concern, and for all the uh, industrial viewers, I'll add this comment, and that is, if you have techniques that are very similar, you're going to start picking up things that may show differences. And if you're comparing a biosimilar to the innovator drug, uh, you probably don't want to see differences. And so I think that, in fact, you do want to see those differences. Those are real things, and you need to be able to take them into account. So things you do, well, Reproducibility is very important, which means running spectra numerous times from different batches, and I can't emphasize that strongly enough. Uh, of course, you can get material from one batch, and it'll be highly reproducible, but uh, you need to look at several different batches, and if there's any variability that you think might be critical in the prepar actual preparation of the protein, that has to be taken into account as well, and I'd say that's the major thing. Modern instruments uh, aren't going to be limiting, I don't think. They're so precise and uh, so accurate in their measurements. You can, of course, cal calibrate them. They should be calibrated. You know, typically CD instruments are calibrated with camphosulfonic acid or some other compound with a highly resolved CD spectrum. But you might consider calibrating the instrument with a particular with a particular protein or even a protein of the same class. And that's going to really help. So, so, so those are some of the ideas. Thank you very much for that response. In fact, uh, in our previous webinar, John Gabrielson had suggested freezing protein aliquots from a single batch is to use as a reference standard to make sure that the instrument is always operating within the parameters that you would anticipate. And of course, what you emphasize right there is for our friends in the biopharmaceutical industry is not to fear the sensitivity and resolution of our instrumentation, and in fact, to embrace that sensitivity and um, resolution 
resolution because you want to discover those changes early on when you're looking at a biosimilar and you don't want to have a mistake later on in the development process. So no, that could be extremely costly. Right. And and so don't don't be fearful, be bold. And I think that's always a good way to approach science. Um, there's a, one other question here from one of our view, uh, viewers. Can you please uh, go into a little more detail on the two types of EPD that you mentioned? Sure. In in the first type that we developed, we just put all the data in the form of a giant matrix. And we use the we don't normalize the data necessarily. I mean, because all we're really interested in measuring is change there. And the the vectors correspond to vectors of change, not absolute things. But we realized that there was a problem and that was the when you looked at the phase diagram, it was sometimes hard to tell how much contribution was coming from uh, an, from one of the methods that were used to construct the phase diagram. In the case of the original version of the phase diagram, I mean, it was all done arbitrarily, and of course the colors had no meaning. Um, there is some meaning now to the second version, which by the way is much easier to program to, and uh, you can actually look at it and tell, gee, the major contribution is coming from the CD measurement, from the fluorescence measurement, or whatever method you might use. That's why we made the two types, and we usually, uh, we, we usually determine both and look at them. And one thing you sometimes have trouble with, we have mathematical methods for determining the phase diagram, I won't, for determining the boundaries of the phases, I won't go into that, but um, if, if you find differences, then you may find one method works better than the other. Uh, thank you very much. If there are any additional questions that any of our uh, viewers, listeners have for Dr. Medow that they think of and they haven't submitted yet, um, please send them to us and we'll submit them to Dr. Medow and he'll be able to answer those questions offline and you'll be able to get a complete response. So anything you think of after the webinar is over, you can still get your um, questions uh, resolved um, by Dr. Medow. I, I really want to thank Dr. Medow greatly for his time and contribution to our webinar. It's a real honor to have him here, and in fact, from a personal point of view, one of the highlights of uh, my tenure here at um, Applied Photophysics is getting to meet Dr. Madai a year and a half ago at the Breckenridge Conference. He's, a, he's really a wonderful scientist, and those of you who have not been able to look at his papers should really dig some of them up. There are over 400 of them, so they're pretty easy to access. So I want to thank all our viewers today for your time. Uh, we really appreciate that. Of course, recordings of today's presentation will be sent to all registrants tomorrow, whether they viewed um, our presentation today or not. I also want to announce that for the first time, Applied Photophysics is offering a travel award to the Biophysical Conference, which will be held in Baltimore next year. For more information, email me at keith.solomon at photophysics.com or look for a link soon to be appearing on our website. So those of you who have submitted uh, an abstract to the um, BPS and have gotten accepted, um, you'll, we'll send you some information on how you can convert that acceptance into a travel award from Applied Photophysics. So please look for that. Uh, I also want to say, please join us again for the next installment of this webinar series which we will continue to inform our viewers about recent innovations in the acquisition and analysis of CD data. In the meantime, if you have any questions about the Chiroscan instrument platform and our other product lines, please visit us at www.photophysics.com. Thank you.